So what are possible outcomes? Um, you could have essentially no effect of the treatment difference on test scores. Here's a bar chart um, of test scores, and I haven't labeled this axis. It's meant to be abstract, but uh, this difference doesn't look like very much. What happens when there is no statistically reliable difference between the two? What are some possible reasons you might observe little or no difference in, in scores as illustrated here? So certainly the most obvious is that the instructional treatment doesn't influence learning. It doesn't matter one way or another whether there are graphics present or not, at least the kinds of graphics uh, in text used in your particular study. It may be, however, that the instructional uh, treatment does influence learning, but there are not enough learners in your study to detect a difference. And there are techniques like power analysis for trying to determine what's a reasonable number of participants to detect a difference under certain assumptions. It could be that your assessments don't have the right questions to de detect differences in learning. They might be of the wrong kind. They actually are learning, but you're not measuring uh, the learning on your assessment because you don't have the right questions to tap it. Maybe there are too few questions and there's just not reliable enough uh, of a measurement um, given that students sometimes uh, get things wrong by uh, uh, slipping up even when they know it or get it right by guessing. Could be that your assessment is just generally too easy and everybody does really well and then you can't really tell. Even though some learn more than others, you can't see that because there aren't hard enough questions to show, uh, to, to let the ones who learn more shine. Or conversely, it could be too hard and nobody does very well. And even though some people learned, they didn't learn enough to, to do well on your questions. But if you had had easier questions, you might have seen a difference. Another possibility is that the treatment could work, but it wasn't really experienced long enough to have an impact. And finally, uh, it could be that A and B are different in unintended ways, and other variables have confounded the effects of the treatment. Um, maybe the graphics are better, but maybe, for example, you might have tried to control for the amount of information by eliminating some text in the text situation uh, going back to this image you know here we have a little bit less text than here well maybe it's because of a particular piece of text that you eliminated that if you had included it here um, and left something else out you would have gotten an effect so that would be a, a so-called confound in the experiment that there's some some other unintended way in which a and b are different so let's talk a little bit about statistics. I briefly mentioned this issue of, of variability in what you measure. So imagine a study with uh, music on, see if music is distracting or, or without music. I should say, by the way, that we'll talk later about reasons why graphics might hurt, as was potentially indicated in that last data set, although the difference was small. But sometimes graphics will help, and, and we'll learn more about what makes the difference between when they help and when they hurt. Um, the same might be true about music, but um, certainly if the music is irrelevant to the content, it is likely to produce extraneous processing that may hurt learning. And so after instruction, uh, an ins lesson with music uh, versus a lesson without, let's say the those with it on average scored 80%, and they had some variation, right? and those without music scored 100%, and they had some variation. I apologize, but these labels are wrong here. Let's see, when we go forward, I think we will want to consider the, that it's the labels down here that are, that are wrong. Um, I should get this fixed, but this should be, uh, let's say, 80, 85, 90, right? This is 90%, not 100%. Um, let's say the standard deviation between the two is 10, right? Then that suggests that between 70 and 80, again, the good bulk of your participants will have scores within 70 and 80, about two thirds of them if the standard deviation is 10. In here, you would have a good bulk of them between, did I say 70 and 80? I should have said between 70 and 90. In here, most of them will between, be between 90 and 100. And there'll be some overlap, but not very much. So this is a case where you're likely to have an effect. Um, so 
Statistical significance is the probability that the results could have occurred by chance. And then effect size here is about whether the uh, differences between the two means, which is 80 minus 90, uh, how big is that difference relative to the standard de deviation? Usually, if they are different, it's the standard deviation of the control condition, if the control condition is, in this case, it doesn't matter because they're the same. But, so we're going to divide 90 minus 80 by 10 and get 1. So this should be 80, 85, and 90. Apologies. So effect sizes are used all over the place to give a sense for how powerful effects are. So here's one graph of 318 studies that reported effect size that shows how variable effect sizes can be. Um, they're often just a little bit above zero, sometimes getting up to 0.25 uh, or 0.5, but rarely getting above one, uh, and sometimes they're negative, but it's somewhat more often to be positive and small, right? So moving on from that brief overview of statistics, and hopefully it's a review for you of, of what you've learned before, how is research uh, relevant um, and how does it bear on uh, different kinds of learners and whether uh, the learners in the study you're reading about are like your learners. Research relevance should be judged based on a number of factors like that, um, sometimes referred to as ecological validity. If the experiment was done in a laboratory with college sophomores in California, you might wonder whether the same results would work for elementary kids in an urban school in New York City. City perhaps doesn't matter so much, but certainly age group, race, uh, those other factors, prior knowledge may well make a difference. So research that is worth looking at usually has some kind of test or treatment group, a control group. It has a sample that's representative of, this, of a sample that you care about. It has a post-test, as we've shown before. It has random assignment. And ideally, it has a pretest, which was not illustrated in what I did before. Um, but a pretest certainly helps to assure that even if you randomized, there might be differences between the two groups, and a pretest can help determine that. So uh, there are a lot of reviews of research that give a more robust picture than single experiments. Um, this book called Visible Learning is a great collection. It's a collection of collections. It, ha it collects 800 meta-analyses where each meta-analysis is a collection of usually something like 50 to 100 or even 200 different studies. So this is like 800 times 100 studies all collected in one book with a bunch of summaries usually shown in these meters of what the average effect size is across the, say, 50 to 100 studies in the meta-analysis. Uh, this was a Department of Ed publication from 2007. Actually, I, uh, I was on this panel that put together this practice guide for applying learning science to improve instruction. Again, the, the both reports re rely on multiple uh, versions of experiments testing roughly the same thing. And this is often called replication in the literature, and that's what it's uh, called in the book. I really hate the name replication because it's not just about repeating the same study. Uh, what you're really after in is generalization. Um, uh, I, they shouldn't be called replication studies. They should be called generalization studies. Uh, and they're related to this very important idea um, in uh, inference on experiments about external validity. Does the pr principle generalize to different content, different students, different contexts? And our work that led to the CLE framework suggests that the generalizations are not as broad as sometimes are, is suggested by uh, reports like this. That's why we should do learning science, not just apply it. So in most contexts, it is what a person can do, not what they say that really matters. So um, when you're measuring learning, it's really important to not just ask them to, uh, say, repeat the instruction you gave them or ask them whether they learned, but to actually see whether they can apply what uh, was in the instruction, instructional experience in, in new contexts um, and uh, whether they perform better, whether they can do something better. So getting your measures of learning to get at 
uh, true application at uh, bringing the new knowledge or skills or principles to bear is key to having and you should look in, in research studies that their assessments do this. Relevant research reports on statistical significance, but also practical significance in these numbers. Sometimes people, I think, overemphasize these numbers. Evidence is evidence. It's not the truth. It's something that's less than 0.05 at 0.04 is really not that much different from 0.06. Um, this threshold is not magic. It is possible that uh, treatment can look significant, but just by chance. One in 20, if your p-value is 0.05 or 0.048, then it suggests that you know if you were to run that experiment 20 times, at least once that treatment would, about once that treatment would, would show a better effect just by chance. Uh, that's what the statistics suggest. So the odds here, if you run a lot of studies, are that, and, and certainly the research community has, that one in 20 studies is going to have a positive effect that's actually false. It's also the case that good treatments may not produce significant effects. Small p-values and effect sizes can be associated with reliable and valuable instructional programs. So treat these as information, uh, but with, grain, with a grain of salt. And look for results across multiple contexts. Uh, don't just trust one study. Also look for theory. So that's a quick overview of applying ev evidence-based practice. You should be thinking about these issues as you read the, the chapters going forward. Uh, can you identify research approaches uh, to study instructional effect, that study effect, instructor, instructional effectiveness? Can you identify what are features of these experiments? When are they good? Think about some of the readings you already had and whether those are good experiments. Um, when there is a report of no effect, what are some of the reasons that that might be the case? What kind of research might be relevant for the kind of job you might want to have in an organization that you might want to work for? Can you interpret significance in statistics on studies?